So I think I expected to walk in here and see a bunch of shoes. No shoes. No, sh there. Uh, well, there might be a few just on the floor someplace. A, a few pair hanging around <laughs> that, that you wore. That might over. actually be worn by yeah. somebody. <laughs> <laughs> but what is this place? Where are we? Uh, some people would call this my man cave. I mean, you know, for lack of a better term. Um, but it really is a studio for me to come and do work and get away from virtually everybody. And uh, it's also kind of a, a playground for friends of mine who are musicians and, you know, people in bands. And, uh, and then uh, sometimes they come in here and play and uh, they sort of have to let me sit in with them a little bit, <laughs> even though I'm not good enough. <laughs> I'm not going to charge you rent, but you got to let me play? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Well, why aren't there any shoes around? Uh, you know, um, I think that's a, that's a strategy of yeah. sorts to um, kind of look at the world uh, uh, sort of outside of the kind of the everyday. And uh, for me, thinking about music or art, there's a bunch of art on the wall here. Um, some that I've done, some that I've had friends do. Um, it's just a it's just a way to sort of expand um, kind of the, kind of your horizon by actually eliminating some things. And so, uh, if I just have sneakers all around me, I, I can get stuck like anybody else. So, does each of these things represent, I guess, a phase of tinker or something that you you want to be or <laughs> wish you were? Or uh, it, it seems like a pretty eclectic mix. Oh, uh, um, well, I think that. I think that sort of what works for me is being eclectic and is uh, experiencing uh, lots of different things. So, like I know you're, uh, you're a musician as well as, a, as, a, as an athlete and now of course you're, you're uh, in the world of uh, entertainment quite frankly and, uh, and on television and I think those are all admirable uh, traits because it shows you have a breadth of you know, kind of talent and experience, and it, and it probably uh, will serve you well down the road because you've just had lots of different experiences. And so I strive to do that, whether, they're, whether it's riding motorcycles, which my wife hates, <laughs> uh, to, um, you know, surfing and, uh, and or playing music. Um, I'm just trying to, trying to uh, load up the, uh, the files in my head so that I have lots of experiences to draw from when I do actually have to sit down and design something. I think there's two ideas of what a designer's workshop should look like in my mind. One is this stark, clean, architectural, you know, <laughs> yeah. your drafting board. I've been in a few. And then there's this. There's the, the creative. Um, how does this space inspire you? Uh, I think it just inspires me because it's not so perfect and not so clean and not so one-dimensional. And so um, I look around and I'm just going, whoa, man, you know, I, th sh I, I, should, I should quit drawing and quit designing and go take that Volkswagen out and take it for a spin and throw a surfboard on the top and maybe go to the beach or something. And I think that, you know, you look around and you just do sort of, uh, we, our lives are complicated and uh, sometimes you need to be reminded to go, to go do something, do something different. Does that type of attitude influence your design? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I often say that when I sit down to design something, it could be a, I'm an architect so I can design buildings, but most notably I design sneakers doesn't matter, but when I sit down to design something, what I draw is literally, I think it's literally a combination of everything that I've done and seen and experienced in my life. It just comes back out, which is, uh, you know, if you've done a lot of stuff, then it's a, it's, you can never run out of ideas, probably. Knock on wood. Yeah. <laughs> Part of the reason why the idea for this interview came up is because of the the design series that has just come out on on Netflix. Tell yeah. us a little bit about that. Yeah, well, uh, it was probably about a year, about a year ago. Um, Netflix approached Nike PR and uh, wanted to include me in this series. Um, and what it is is basically basically a collection of documentaries, eight different documentaries about eight different designers from around the world. 
How they got to the list that they did, I don't know necessarily, but I, uh, obviously I was on that list. I didn't even want to do it because I'm like, oh, it's going to be another Nike commercial. They're going to hype up some Jordan stuff or, or it was going to be something that I've already been through and, and I thought it would be a little bit invasive. And uh, yet uh, one, of our, one of our PR guys uh, who knew these people uh, and knew Netflix and knew uh, Radical Media as the company that actually produced all this stuff, he said, no, these guys are cool. They're, they, they have a good idea. You should do it. And, and so uh, I, then I, I finally said, okay, I'll, I'll do it, but I, I hope it doesn't just get in the way of what, what I should be doing in my life. And um, sure enough, they came in, and they were really young and cool and interesting and, and uh, became more like buddies, and they were just following me around, and I wasn't staged very much, and I could just sort of keep doing what I do. And... Um, uh, so, uh, so anyway, the, the, the result of, of that, all of that uh, is a 45-minute um, documentary about not just my design life, but um, there's some cool stuff about uh, how I, where I grew up and who I was influenced by, including my father and Bill Bowerman, and, and um, uh, it gets a little, even a little bit emotional because they, 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 they really studied, studied beforehand and uh, they had a story they wanted to tell. So it was kind of cool. The other reason why we're sitting and talking is because you are an Oregonian. <laughs> you, you are, you are a, a native son. You are ah, yeah. born and raised. Um, Long, now, lifelong. is it... Lynn Central Lynn High Central School. Central Lynn High School. That's correct. Yeah, right uh, in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> yeah. Well, the middle of nowhere produced a, uh, a three-sport All-American in high school. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> that yeah. is actually even football. Yeah, even football. Uh, <laughs> which you which you've t you've told me once or twice. You yeah, make sure I, I try, let people know that you're not just exactly. You know, I can catch a football. <laughs> yeah, you know. but most but but you ended up running track. Um, at Oregon, yeah, and yeah, yeah. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, do you still hold the pole vault record, or was did you leave with the pole vault record? Uh, I held it while I was there. While you were um, there, but you know, it's long since gone under the under the bridge. Um, and we've uh, Oregon has had uh, such great success in track over the years that. Uh, I think even Steve Prefontaine's records are all yeah. long gone. So. Yeah, that's, that's true. But I think that the pole vault may kind of speak to just this whole picture of Tinker. Is, is to me, the pole vault seems like a little bit of a, a one-off. Yeah. You think of track yeah. and field. You think of running and throwing and yeah, jumping. exactly. You don't think of bending a, uh, a, fiberglass, a 20-foot fiberglass pole and, and vaulting yourself over the top of a bar. Uh, it, good point. It's, it, it, I think it kind of fits. Uh, yeah, I think it does. I think that um, I'm drawn toward, um, you know, unique uh, activities and uh, things that re maybe require kind of a multiple of uh, skills and maybe a little bit of lack of, of, uh, of common sense because I don't know of anybody who would just sort of naturally want to go out and do something like that. But having said that, you know, um, I was a sprinter and a hurdler and I did do all those other track events. Uh, and had some success at, at them, but um, it seemed like the pole vault was a, was the best fit after, in the end. Mm -hmm. So, now, did your dad coach you in high school? Yeah, my my father was uh, was uh, even at a small, and I think when I was in high school, that Central Inn had like 400 students, mm -hmm. so it was like in the the old classification. It was it was A1. This would be like the, yeah, you know, Portland schools. A2 was just the next level down, and then there was B. There were just oh, wow. three classifications. Okay. So uh, my school, of 400 kids, we, we were competing against schools that maybe were like 800 kids, mm -hmm. and 800 and above was A1. Anyway, um, my, my father was, a, was the coach and the athletic director, and every once in a while when he'd fire the football coach or the basketball coach, he'd step in for a year and, be, <laughs> and coach that stuff too, in addition to his track duties. Um, but he, he did definitely get me started in, uh, in track and field in particular, and he was a pole vaulter. So, uh, so I kind of knew a little bit about it uh, from, from photos that I saw in his, his portfolio. <laughs> how, much, how much of that experience you know, interacting with your dad um, shaped 
how much of that shaped who you are right now? Yeah, he was tough. Um, he was tough on me. Uh, he was a disciplinarian, you know, work hard, you know, don't mess around. Um, you know, he had his, in those years, uh, corporal punishment was still legal. <laughs> He had, a, he had a, a baseball bat that was sawed in half, but with the handle intact. <laughs> and <laughs> you did not want to get the, get the bat. Yeah. Um, uh, this was at school, too. Yeah. It wasn't at home. Yeah. This was at school. Uh, so that's the kind of uh, world that some of us grew up in in a previous era. And, he, and, and I, you know, in many ways, it was, it was rugged. But uh, in, that, in that other ways, uh, it sort of um, uh, teaches you to like knuckle down and get yeah. the job done. So, so I think he was. I think that that part of my education, which was just to work hard and and uh, be a, be tough, uh, came from him for sure. I imagine Bill Bowerman wasn't exactly a, a walk in the park either. <laughs> True, Bill Bowerman uh, was also of that that same era. However, uh, there was a big difference. He he was was. Uh, a very sophisticated kind of mentor and coach, teacher. He didn't really like the word coach. He preferred to be referred to as a teacher of competitive response. <laughs> that's I like that. That's what he told him. I may about. have to use it. <laughs> it's pretty good. Uh, but um, but he, uh, he taught me something actually quite a bit different, um, which added to the kind of being, you know, kind of working hard and being tougher. He, he was all about working smart, and he struggled to get Steve Prefontaine and some of his other distance runners to run less, mm -hmm. be, be more fresh, and, and to be smart about how you worked out and how you trained so that you were always really m much more primed and ready on competition day. And a lot of uh, people um, maybe had this more militaristic approach, which was you just work hard, work hard, work hard, work hard, and then go do it. But you, sometimes that may, is, may not be the smartest move. So that was what I learned from Bill Barman. It was like, work hard, but work, work smart. Be smart. Be strategic. All these really life-shaping experiences happened in the state of Oregon. Yeah. Impressive. <laughs> I, I think it's fair to say that um, this is home for you. And, and, and I know f for me personally, you know, getting drafted and heading out to Detroit and then Miami and Atlanta and bouncing around the yeah. country playing sports, there was always this feeling of, no matter what was going on out here, there was always a feeling of belonging mm -hmm. back home. Is that, does that exist for you? I, I think it's very important to me and um, to sort of echo and reflect back to you, yeah, your, your experience, um, even though you were in all those different places, we always, we, the same thing kind of was reflected back to you. You were always part of Oregon, even though you were playing in, in Detroit and other places. So um, I think that um, there's something maybe when growing up here that kind of does stay with you. And uh, for me, it's uh, uh, maybe it doesn't get talked about quite enough that, uh, that this state of kind of few people um, does produce some pretty extraordinary results uh, in in sports and uh, and in other endeavors for sure. It's, it's, I think it's I think it's impressive. I was I was thinking of what to call this piece as I was driving over, and it's, and I and I kept coming back to get to know your neighborhood world class designer, <laughs> you know, which which I think <laughs> yeah, the, dude right down the, yeah street. the guy that just tinkered down the street. <laughs> but you've you've mentioned Jordan a couple times for for those who don't know. Um, you know, you, you came to a world fame designing Jordan, starting yeah. with uh, Jordan three, correct? Correct, that's correct. Yeah, and I uh, you were you were the lead designer for everything through fifteen. Yeah, I uh, so I think you could say, um, kind of in, in simplistic terms, I designed the three through the fifteen. Mm -hmm. Then I took a little break. Um, which is discussed in the Netflix show, by yeah. the way, a little bit. But then I started again. Michael personally really wanted me to come back and do the 20, and then I did a few, did several more after that. But uh, but I think I had a pretty good run up through the 15 when he was playing at his, you know, winning his championships, which was what a, an amazing experience for me to be associated with him and and to be hanging with 
uh, not just a great athlete, but a kind of a historic figure, really. How did you reconcile that feeling of being a kid from Central Lynn High School with suddenly being a, a sneaker icon? I mean, <laughs> yeah. Somebody who is designing something that is, um, that is renowned around the world. I, I try, I basically try not to pay too much attention to it because I think that uh, even though people might be, be interested in a past design or maybe one that's come out, um, as, you, as you well know, you know, kind of most of us live in the future. We, you know, we have, to be, we have to work on projects that aren't coming out for a year, year and a half, or we have to think, think more forward. And so uh, that kind of, uh, that kind of, job requires um, kind of almost like you sort of like put the put what you've just done kind of in a you know in a in a, in a safe or in, in a in a case someplace and you just move on so I really don't think too much about um, all of this um, sort of s this the sneaker collector kind of craze that's going on although um, I, I, I have to admit it's uh, uh, I'm I'm getting stopped on the street more and more, and and it's it's you know it, it, it's not a bad feeling or it's not it's not a bother, but it does sort of that does remind me uh, a little bit more about the kind of the worldwide nature of this of this business. So so is this fame? Is, is this new? I mean, is this something that <laughs> that has come around in the last few years? I mean, I would think that you know if you're designing Michael Jordan shoes, that would be the pinnacle. But you're selling. What I'm hearing is that. It's more now that people are realizing the, the collectability or the iconic nature of what was, and, and that has yeah, kind of pushed, yeah. pushed it a little I, bit farther. I think, you, I think you sort of hit the nail on the head that, well, there was def definitely, uh, there have been uh, sneaker collectors that have known about uh, my work or Nike's work and Jordan work for, for a long time, and, you know, uh, those, those people are, you know, quite complimentary. But but uh, it's been more recently. Um, I think the I think the fact that sneakers have become um, a worldwide phenomenon, even outside the the the, uh, the sports environment. So if I go to Paris, um, I'm signing autographs in the street, it's, which wouldn't necessarily have been the case back when I was designing for for Michael Jordan because it. It, when you go to Paris, it's not, you're, it's not like everybody knows about even Michael Jordan, or they don't even met, necessarily know about um, like sports, um, but they now know about this, this design um, side of, of uh, the, the influential side of the design that, say, I'm working on or that, that we're doing collectively. It's pretty weird. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think it, it's fair to say that not only have your designs... Um, been, I don't want to say world changing in in the fashion side, but also in the functional side. Because, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but you were one of the first to come up with a, a, a true cross training mm -hmm. shoe. I think that what separates Nike from, say, a fashion house um, is the fact that we still start our projects, and I start every project, um, thinking about how to help improve an athlete's performance. And it might be a world-class athlete uh, in the Olympics or in the NBA or the NFL, or it might just be someone who's trying to just run every day or, or work out in a gym. And uh, so cross-training kind of popped up because of my own experience at the Metro Y here in Portland. Remember back when that thing was rolling? Oh, yeah. And uh, it was really one of the first big clubs where you could go and do a mul multiple activities uh, at a pretty decent level. And you could get in a basketball game, you could get an aerobics class, you could lift weights, run around on the indoor track. There were a lot of things that people were doing, and uh, I, I started thinking, well, dang, I mean, I, I was like taking four or five different pairs of shoes so I could sort of change shoes. But then I'm like, well, why don't we just, just design a shoe that's pretty good for all of that stuff? So, born in Portland. <laughs> born in Portland at the Metro YMCA. <laughs> Cross training. Yeah. How does it make you feel when you see a kid in the neighborhood wearing a shoe that, I guess, a cross-training design? Or do you ever sit and think when you see a kid wearing a cross-training shoe running down the street that, that you had a hand in that? Uh, I, 
I do. I used to probably a little bit more, but now my, I don't think about it so much. Although sometimes um, those kids might know, and they go, they'll come up and go, "Hey, is, did you do this one?" Yeah. And I'm like, "Yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe." Uh, but but I don't think I, I don't that just that just would be an, an invasive kind of way to live because um, it, it's uh, it's it's almost to the point where. Um, but like my design work is is a bit ubiquitous. It's everywhere. And uh, I took a trip a while, uh, several years ago. This was very strange um, kind of experience. But I went all over the place. Went to some, just took a break. I went to some Caribbean islands. We took took Jackie, my wife, mm -hmm. and we went to Europe. We went to different places in the U.S. Um, some out of the way places. Never once went anywhere anywhere, including tiny little desert islands where I didn't see something that I had designed. And I was thinking, I came back and I'm like, wow, that's crazy. And I didn't think about the fact that, oh, I'm just some sort of great designer and I'm just like everybody loves it. I thought about, wow, it's the power of sport and it's the power of Nike kind of uh, that uh, makes, um, makes these, design these designs so coveted and um, fit into lives all over the all over the place and so it, it kind of gave me a different a kind of unique perspective I hadn't thought even thought of it that way when you see those designs around the world does it make you think of Portland <sighs> yeah uh, um, I, I am super proud to be an Oregonian I grew up in a small town but I've lived a, the bulk of my life in either Eugene or Portland most of it in, uh, you know, past 35 or 36 years have been here in Portland. Uh, so I think of myself as a Portlander, and I think of uh, certainly uh, of the fact that I grew up in Oregon, and I have uh, just, I have a lot of pride, there's a lot of pride in that. And I think it's cool, uh, people even maybe uh, are kind of amazed that um, world-class stuff can happen uh, in such a small state with a s small population. And I, I think that's, that's just, um, it's cool because it gives people hope because not everybody lives in New York City or Los Angeles and uh, yet they can look and see, and see examples of success, you know, coming from out of the way places. So I, I love that. I think that's great. And uh, you're an example of that to me as well. That, you know, uh, you grew up in, in my neighborhood, you know, essentially. And um, right now, what, you live two houses or three or four, no, <laughs> three blocks away? Um, and I'm like, wow, there, there are some uh, really amazing people that just live right in my own neighborhood, not just my own town or my own state, but right, right in the hood. I mean, it's so cool. I like that. What would you say to somebody who... Who wants to do something great but thinks that they're just from, they're just from Oregon? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I think they just. I just simply think that people who um, feel like they might be constrained by coming from a smaller state or a smaller town or whatever, um, they just just need to do a little research and find out that um, gr uh, people, great people or people with success, can come from anywhere, and. Um, it, uh, maybe it takes a little bit of uh, good mentoring along the way, which I was, was fortunate to have. And I know you had some great mentors and coaches and people around you. Um, so, uh, so the state is small, but it seems to also have this uh, really um, influential group of leaders and mentors that have, that have helped us all kind of achieve um, beyond maybe what we thought we could. So that's pretty cool, too, because I think the history of the state is, is such that uh, there's some just amazing people that have come from here. So Most notably from Central Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Central Lynn High School, unbelievable. <laughs>